Conference, and I've just come from the Oxford Farming Conference, which has been a bit of a baptism of fire, I have to say, because it, uh, it wasn't the alternative conference, it was the kind of the, the main conference. Um, and it just struck me being there, you know, as I heard George Eustace, the minister, you know, waxing lyrical about how wonderful it is that we can export all of our meat to the Middle East. Oh. Uh, but actually, the need for Green Party policies on every single area is just so urgent. So, you know, I used the time that I had to talk about nature-friendly farming and the emissions from agriculture and the fact that the Committee on Climate Change basically said that emissions from agriculture have failed to reduce at all since 2008 um, and they make up around 10% of the total and so you know it just struck me that that you know whether we're talking about climate change agriculture transport Brexit the economy health or education it doesn't really matter what the issue is the Green Party has got you know such important <coughs> messages to put across and, and increasingly ones that I think the public are very interested in hearing it feels there's such a lack of political leadership on so many issues right now that there's a massive opportunity for us and that's at kind of every level I mean Cheryl was just saying yeah, I'm, I'm the only one in Parliament and, and that is a tragedy on so many levels um, but is also a tragedy because if you take the 2015 general election result the Green Party polled over a million votes and under a proportional system that could have given us around 20 MPs and just when you think about how transformative that could have been you know people could have seen Green Party policies in action Green Party politicians in action then it would have been you know a kind of a, a cumulative um, you know virtuous circle with more people getting elected again so I pay tribute to a wonderful organization called Make Votes Matter that you may well know but they do fantastic work trying to persuade in particular the Labour Party to um, to adopt uh, electoral reform and they're doing some great work at a local level going around the constituency Labour parties trying to um, get them to put down motions uh, to the Labour Party conference for electoral reform because there is actually a, a real groundswell of support for electoral reform in the Labour Party among Labour Party members um, and I've had a few conversations with, with Jeremy himself about this, subtly pointing out that if you're for the many, not the few, then it would be quite handy to give, to give the many uh, a bit more of a voice in, uh, in, in what's happening. And what did he say? Well, what he said, and this is quite interesting, which is why I think it is so important to keep banging on about it. He was saying that as long as um, there was a system of electoral reform that kept the constituency link, which of course there are plenty of reforms that do, then he wouldn't be against it. And what he said was, but it's not an issue I ever hear on the doorstep or in public meetings. Mm. And I just feel that if, you know, if ever you are minded to go to a public meeting that Jeremy's having, or if you know people are going there, <laughs> seriously, if we can raise this issue and make it much more of a, of a hot issue for yeah. them, because it is clear that it would require a certain amount of, of expenditure of political capital on his behalf to support it. Some of his MPs would not be overjoyed at the idea of the kind of constituency boundary changes that would probably be needed if you were to have a form of, for example, additional member system where you have some people elected to represent constituencies and others on the top-up list. If you were to do it that way, in order not to massively increase the total number of MPs in Parliament, you would need to have slightly bigger constituencies in order then to give you space to have the top-up list. So, you know, it's, it's not... It's not cost-free for him to do this, but what we've got to ensure is the cost of not doing it is, is much stronger and much much uh, hotter. So hopefully that is something that that, that campaign is, is is growing. I was um, at a meeting, uh, a cross-party meeting on electoral reform in Parliament a few months ago, so it was attended by MPs, and the good news was that it was practically standing room only. It does feel as if there, there is momentum behind behind that uh, proposal, uh, at least with a small M. I'm not sure if there's momentum with a big M behind it, but uh, <laughs> they were with small and, and why it's so important is because we need to engage people with, with the political system um, and, and there is such distrust, disengagement, disillusionment, anger from people when they when they look at our political system, particularly Westminster I think, and, and who can blame them because the kind of pantomime we've had in, in Parliament in recent weeks has just been so shameful. You know, all of that stupidity about whether or not he said stupid woman or stupid people. Yeah. 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 You know, an awful lot worse and be quite justified. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point of that, you know, stupid 
row, and all the reason for having the row was simply to try to detract from the fact that we've got a Prime Minister who is utterly incapable of leading, who is basically putting her own party interest before the national interest. The way in which she has pulled that Brexit vote now uh, is is just so irresponsible, you know, that, that, that basically what she's trying to do, I think, is to run down the clock so that as we get closer and closer to the March the 29th deadline, then she's going to be able to push MPs into a corner and say, well, if you don't accept my deal, there's literally no other alternative. And that's, that's her only game plan. I think it's so important that when we're campaigning around this issue, um, and, and you know, the Green Party has been very active in the People's Vote campaign, but I just want to say that I think that when we are involved in that, in that debate, it's vital at the same time that we don't fall into the trap, and I'm sure we don't, but the People's Vote campaign sometimes itself does, into being very kind of dismissive of people who voted leave, as if you know, people got it wrong and they were stupid and we've just got asked them to get to do it again. And I'm not suggesting that, that anyone here does do that, but, but it's even more important, I think, for us to be bringing to that People's Vote campaign a real recognition, in a sense, that people who voted leave, many of them, actually had very good reason for trying to give the establishment a kicking, because for decades, they have been ignored by a political establishment. I mean, they've been ignored partly through this electoral system that only ever is interested in what people think if they are in swing seats, the marginal seats. You know, it doesn't matter what you think if you're in a so-called safe seat because the assumption is the same party will get back time and time again. And to the extent that that vote, that Brexit vote, was, was very little actually about the EU and very much about just that sense of anger at communities that have been hollowed out over decades of deindustrialization uh, and neglect, then the, and in a sense that was a completely legitimate and, and in a sense a rational thing to do, to feel that just, things can't get any worse is what people thought. And the tragedy of course is that under any Brexit scenario the situation can get worse and it will get worse for some of the poorest communities. But I don't think we can blame people for thinking that, look, you know, we've now been asked what we think by David Cameron and George Osborne, you know, who wouldn't at that point perhaps feel like, like giving them a kicking was, was, a, was a reasonable thing to, to do metaphorically. Um, and when you map, there's some really interesting work that's been done mapping the areas that voted leave with areas where where there is a sense of hopelessness. There was a thing called the Commission on Social Mobility, and it tracked the 30 places with the worst social mobility last year. And every single one of those 30 voted to leave the EU. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's that sense of people not seeing hope anywhere else. And to my mind, the Green Party is about a hopeful message. And, and, and that you know, the, the, the political system is crying out for a party with a vision and a party with a hopeful message. But for example, when it comes to freedom of movement, it doesn't kind of shuffle our feet and say, oh, we're all be sorry about it, but yes, that's the price you have to pay for the single market, but rather proudly says, yes, we think it's not much, this extraordinary gift to be able to travel and to study and to live and to love in, in 27 other EU member states, and that we welcome people who have come from those countries to make their lives here and have contributed so much to our cultures, to our families, as well as to the economy. So, you know, I feel so proud that the party is is not apologetic about things like that, and, and that we will absolutely stand up for what we believe in, whether that's on Brexit, whether it's on farming, whether it's on health or education or anything else. And the last thing I would just say, because I, I would love to have some question and answers, I have no idea what you're, <laughs> what you're interested in, but I just wanted to say one thing about the, um, the climate crisis in particular, because it was just really extraordinary running up to the... Um, to, 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 the, to the most recent big conference, the climate conference in, in December in, uh, in, in Poland. Because we had every single red light flashing on, on, on government dashboards, or at least it should have been, in, ten, in terms of the IPCC uh, telling us we had 12 years left in order to get off the collision course or off the climate catastrophe. Um, we also had a, a, a report from WWF, or the Living Planet Report, that pointed out that we've lost um, around 60% of wildlife populations in the last 40 years alone. I mean, this is just horrendous, you know? Um, and so we're not lacking the evidence for the bold changes that the party wants to see. And yet, what we saw from the government in response to all of that was in the very same week that that IPCC report came out, talking about 12 years uh, left to get off the collision course, the, 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 the government gave the green light to, to, to fracking. 
the next week there was the budget, and the Chancellor didn't mention the word climate change once. What he did do was to give another £2 billion pounds to fossil fuel subsidies for North Sea extraction. So you've got the sense where the evidence on the one hand is accumulating even more starkly, and in response, you know, almost in inverse proportion to the urgency of doing something differently, the government is taking a course of action that will make matters even worse. And so again, I would just come back to saying, particularly when it comes to the environment crisis, you, you know, I think it is so urgent for our voices to be heard. And frankly, none of the other parties are are really talking about the transformation to our to the economy that we need. So other parties, yes, they'll talk about you know perhaps a, a bit of a, a quicker uh, transition to renewable energy. You know, Labour's talking about that now. But what they don't understand is that if at the same time as, for example, we're supposed to be cutting uh, in emissions dramatically in the next 30 years, over that same time period, the global economy is due to treble in its size. And so unless you address the sort of economy that we have and the kind of outcomes that we set for the economy, in other words, not being fixated on GDP alone, but recognizing actually that our economy is presumably there to make higher well-being, and given that a fixation on GDP alone has not delivered well-being, and to the contrary, has delivered very serious environmental harm and, 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 and catastrophe, then we need to change the economic model too. And I think that is the distinctive message that the, that the Green Party uh, brings at, at, at a national level. Now, I appreciate the town councils and, 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 and district councils and so forth. Some of that might seem less relevant, but actually, some of the same questions are exactly the same. You know, questioning about how local budgets are spent, questioning about how local people are involved in decision making so that people are engaged in the decisions that affect them. You know, making sure that, that environmental considerations are uh, high up on that political agenda. All of those things are things we do when, when we're elected. So it is so vital that we get Terrell elected, and we've got such a good chance now as a result, not least of the um, discussions that have been having with, with, with um, other parties about, about, I don't know how big all of that is, but anyway, the idea that, uh, that we might have a better chance than we might otherwise have had of winning one of those seats, I think is incredibly exciting. And so, um, I don't know many of you, and it may be that you're all working, you know, 60 hours a week on Green Party issues already, but um, if you are, if you could work 61, you could just give an extra a, a hour a week or something, it could make such a difference, because you never know which conversation it is, which leaflet it is, which stall it is, that will make the difference. But what we do know is that if we could all just do one that little bit more, there is such a good chance now of, of winning a seat and having a pretty
little bit more about, about the importance of Green Party policies and Green Party approaches. And I've just come from the Oxford Farming Conference, which has been a bit of a baptism of fire, I have to say, because it, uh, it wasn't the alternative conference, it was the kind of the, the main conference. Um, and it just struck me being there, you know, as I heard George Eustace, the minister, you know, waxing lyrical about how wonderful it is that we can export all of our meat to the Middle East. Oh. <laughs> The need for Green Party policies on every single area is just so urgent. So, you know, I used the time that I had to talk about nature-friendly farming and the emissions from agriculture and the fact that the Committee on Climate Change basically said that emissions from agriculture have failed to reduce at all since 2008. Um, and they make up around 10% of the total. And so, you know, it just struck me that, that, you know, whether we're talking about climate change, agriculture, transport, Brexit, the economy, health or education, it doesn't really matter what the issue is. The Green Party has got, you know, such important <coughs> messages to put across and, and increasingly ones that I think the public are very interested in hearing. It feels there's such a lack of political leadership on so many issues right now that there's a massive opportunity for us. And that's at kind of every level. I mean, Cheryl was just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm the only one in Parliament. And, and that is a tragedy on so many levels. Um, but it's also a tragedy because if you take the 2015 general election result, the Green Party polled over a million votes. And under a proportional system, that could have given us around 20 MPs. Mm. And just when you think about how transformative that could have been, you know, people could have seen Green Party policies in action, Green Party politicians in action, that it would have been, you know, a kind of a, a cumulative, um, you know, virtuous circle with more people getting elected again. So I pay tribute to a wonderful organisation called Make Votes Matter that you may well know, but they do fantastic work trying to persuade, in particular, the Labour Party to um, to adopt uh, electoral reform, and they're doing some great work at a local level, going around the constituency Labour parties trying to um, get them to put down motions uh, to the Labour Party conference for electoral reform, because there is actually a, a real groundswell of support for electoral reform in the Labour Party, among Labour Party members. Um, and I've had a few conversations with, with Jeremy himself about this, subtly pointing out that if you're for the many, not the few, that would be quite handy to give the many uh, a bit more of a voice in, uh, in, in what's happening. And what did he say? Well, what he said, and this is quite interesting, which is why I think it is so important to keep banging on about it. He was saying that as long as um, there was a system of electoral reform that kept the constituency link, which of course there are plenty of, of forms that do, then he wouldn't be against it. And what he said was, but it's not an issue I ever hear on the doorstep or in public meetings. Oh. And I just feel that if, you know, if ever you are minded to go to a public meeting that Jeremy's having, or if you know people are going there, <laughs> seriously, if we can raise this issue and make it much more of a, of a hot issue for yeah. them, because it it is clear that it would require a certain amount of, of expenditure of political capital on his behalf to support it. And some of his MPs would not be overjoyed at the idea of the kind of constituency boundary changes that would probably be needed if you were to have a form of, for example, additional member system where you have some people elected to represent constituencies and others on the top-up list. If you were to do it that way, in order not to massively increase the total number of MPs in Parliament, you would need to have slightly bigger constituencies in order then to give you space to have the top-up list. So, you know, it's, it's not... It's not cost-free for him to do this. But what we've got to ensure is the cost of not doing it is, is much stronger and much, much uh, hotter. So hopefully that is something that that, that campaign is, is, is growing. I was um, at a meeting, uh, a cross-party meeting on electoral reform in Parliament a few months ago. So it was attended by MPs. And the good news was that it was practically standing for both feel as if uh, there is a momentum behind, behind that uh, proposal, uh, at least with a small end. I'm not sure if there's a momentum with a big end behind it, but uh, <laughs> they went with a small end. And, and why it's so important is because we need to engage people with, with the political system. Um, and, and there is such distrust, disengagement, disillusionment, anger from people when they when they look at our political system, particularly Westminster, I think, and, and who can blame them? Because the kind of pantomime we've had in, in Parliament in recent weeks has just been so shameful. You know, all of that stupidity about whether or not he said stupid things 
And yet, what we saw from the government in response to all of that was in the very same week that that IPCC report came out, talking about 12 years 
letting it off the condition course. The, 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 the government gave the green light to, to, to fracking. Uh, the next week there was the budget, and the Chancellor didn't mention the word climate change once. What he did do was to give another three billion pounds to fossil fuel subsidies for North Sea extraction. So you've got the sense where the evidence on the one hand is accumulating even more starkly, and in response, you know, almost in inverse proportion to the urgency of doing something differently, the government is taking a course of action that will make matters even worse. And so again, I would just come back to saying, particularly when it comes to the environment crisis, you, you know, I think it is so urgent for our voices to be heard. And frankly, none of the other parties are are really talking about the transformation to our to the economy that we need. So other parties, yes, they'll talk about you know perhaps a, a bit of a, a, a quicker uh, transition to renewable energy. You know, Labour's talking about that now. But what they don't understand is that if at the same time as, for example, we're supposed to be cutting uh, in emissions dramatically in the next 30 years, over that same time period, the global economy is due to treble in its size. And so unless you address the state of economy that we have and the kind of outcomes that we set for the economy, in other words, not being fixated on GDP alone, but recognizing actually that our economy is presumably there to make higher well-being, and given that a fixation on GDP alone has not delivered well-being, and to the contrary, has delivered very serious environmental harm and, 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 and catastrophe, then we need to change that economic model too. And I think that is the distinctive message that the, that the Green Party uh, brings at, at, at a national level. And I appreciate the town councils and, 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 and district councils and so forth. Some of that might seem less relevant, but actually some of the same questions are exactly the same. You know, questioning about how local budgets are spent, questioning about how local people are involved in decision making so that people are engaged in the decisions that affect them. You know, making sure that, that environmental considerations are uh, high up on that political agenda. All of those things are things we do when, when we're elected. So it is so vital that we get terrible elected and we've got such a good chance now as a result not least of the um, discussions that have been having with, with, with um, other parties about, about, I don't know how public order that is, but anyway, the idea that uh, that we might have a better chance than we might otherwise have had of winning one of those seats. I think it's incredibly exciting. And so, um, I don't know many of you, and it may be that you're all working you know, 60 hours a week on Green Party issues already, but um, if you are, if you could work 61, that would be wonderful. If you could just give an extra a, a hour a week or something, it could make such a difference, because you never know which conversation it is, which leap it is, which stall it is, that will make the difference. But what we do know is that if we could all just do one that little bit more, there is such a good chance now of, of winning a seat and having a brilliant candidate representing the Green Party here locally, which would be fantastic. So I'll end there, but I'm very happy to take any conversations or questions on any or... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>